Hey everybody, video here for you today. This is the third Monday in a row, Ancient History News. I think this is going to become a series. We're going to start it off in Spain today. We're going to go down to the Temple of Debod in Spain. This is located in Madrid. And Zahiwas has been in the news lately. I've read more than a few articles. This is the temple here today. What does Spain and Zahiwas have to do with each other? Well, let's go down and take a peek. Here we are down on Street View, and the Temple of Debod is a Egyptian temple, and it was given to Spain as a gift. This happened just days ago. Hawass holds press conference at Debod Temple in Madrid. Dr. Zahi Was, the Egyptian archaeologist, said that he was surprised at the good work at Debod Temple in Madrid during his speech at the press conference. Hawass sank Madrid for it contributing to saving the Nubia temples and villages and urging concerned officials to protect the temple from rain and erosion. It will be a great landmark for all mankind. Meanwhile, the Madrid mayor said that authorities would form a committee immediately to study how to protect the Dabad temple from rain. Noteworthy, Hawass' statement caused stir and the mayor announced that next week he would begin taking measures to cover the temple in front of the Spanish street. Here's another story that came out recently. Here is Zahi down in King Tut's tomb. Remember the Olmec cave video from last week and the depiction of the god or the person wearing the jaguar fur? Well, here is a priest from Egypt wearing a leopard skin fur. That is common. But Zahi here, he's on a mission. It says, Hawass told the media line that he is putting together a committee of Egyptian intellectuals and foreigners to press the British Museum in London, the Louvre in Paris, and two museums in Germany, and one in Boston, to return five important artifacts to Egypt. They are unique objects and aren't supposed to be outside as they left the country illegally, Hawass said. And you should know all about illegal stuff, Zai. Here's a story that came out about four or five days ago. Prominent Egyptologist and former Minister of Antiquities, Zahi Was, implored Minister of Education, Tariq Shaki to assign schools to begin teaching Egyptian hieroglyphs during a television interview with Al Haya Ayam program. I don't have a problem with that. I think Egyptian hieroglyphs should be taught, but I have had plenty of issues with that. Oh, wait a minute. I'm reporting the news. Let's just get on with it. This came out in the Jordan Times here. It says Egyptian archaeologist Hua sees himself as custodian of the antiquities. Standing at the foot of the great, towering Great Sphinx of Giza, Zahi Awas revels in his reputation as indefatigable and controversial figure in the enigmatic world of Egyptology. With early morning sun-kissed pyramids behind him, the 72-year-old dubbed the Egyptian Indiana Jones posed casually for photos sporting his trademark cowboy hat. Awas, who has appeared in dozens of documentaries about ancient Egypt, is himself a star attraction for a luxury archaeological tour organized by an operator based in Poland, a larger-than-life character who sees himself as the custodian of Egyptian antiquities. He evokes in the same breath ancient deities and pharaohs, as well as his own name. All right, I've had enough with this story. Let's move on. Next story, let's go down to Australia. This is Lake Conda. And this is in the very southern region. This is where they had some fires here, devastating fires. Now, Lake Honda is in Booj Bim National Park. And if I'm mispronouncing that, somebody over there or somebody who knows, please correct me. But this is the area that was devastated by fires. But what they did reveal is some ancient waterways after all the vegetation and trees were burned off. This is Atlas Obscure, and I've used them before. Australian wildfires uncovered hidden sections of a huge ancient aquaculture system. And this story was printed February Here 6th. Here is a look at one of the areas where these ancient waterways were found. And the culture here, they think, goes back about 6,000, 7,000 years. And who knows how far back it went. Here is another place, and who knows how ancient this is. But they're guesstimating it goes back into the Neolithic, people controlling the waterways here. Here is another article on the story, and here's a look at the area affected. Originally made to catch eels and fish, the aquaculture system is primarily composed of a mixture of weirs, channels, and dams made from volcanic rocks. It was built by the indigenous 
Gutijamara people, native to the region now known as south of the Australian state, Victoria. Well, that was certainly an interesting story coming from Australia. People have always been trying to control the waterways of the world. Essential for life. Let's move on. Next story, we're going down to the Altai Mountains in Mongolia. And there has been some work done here. 5,200-year-old grains in the eastern Altai Mountains redate trans-Eurasian crop exchange. Here are some standing stones in the area. And these are called the stone men, and they go back about 4,000 years. Cereals from the Fertile Crescent and broom corn millet from northern China spread across the ancient world, integrating into complex farming systems that use crop rotation cycles enabled by different ecological regions of origin. The resulting productivity allowed for demographic expansions and imperial formations in, in Europe and Asia. The resulting productivity allowed for demographic expansions and imperial formations in Europe and Asia. In this study, an internal interdisciplinary team of scientists illustrate that people move these crops across Eurasia earlier than previously realized, adapting cultivation methods for harsh agricultural environments. Radiocarbon dating shows that the grains include the oldest examples of wheat and barley ever recorded this far north in Asia, pushing the dates for early farming in the region back by at least a millennia. So maybe not the most exciting story, but coming from Mongolia, I haven't covered that lately. And I don't even remember the last time I did, but there are some standing stones coming from the area. And with everything else, history just gets pushed back. People were doing things a lot earlier, and we haven't given these early people enough credit for doing the things they did. Let's move on. Next story, let's go down to the Amur River in Siberia. There has been some interesting discoveries made here lately. This is the 10th longest river in the world. Just read. This is Heritage Daily, and these are clay pots that come from the Ice Age a long, long time ago. The research, which was undertaken at the University of York, also suggests there was no single point of origin for the world's oldest pottery. Academics extracted and analyzed ancient fats and lipids that have been preserved in pieces of ancient pottery found at a number of sites on the Amur River in Russia, whose dates range between 16,000 and 12,000 years old. This study illustrates the exciting potential of new methods in archaeological science. We can extract and interpret the remains of meals that were cooked in pots over 16,000 years ago. It is interesting that the pottery emerges during these very cold periods, not during the comparatively warmer periods when forest resources such as game and nuts were more available. The new study demonstrates that the world's oldest clay cooking pots were made in very different ways in different parts of Northeast Asia, indicating a parallel process of innovation where separate groups that had no contact with each other started to move towards similar kinds of technological solutions in order to survive. Next story, let's go down to Egypt, down near Luxor here, the Mortuary Temple of Amenhotep III. Interesting discovery made here. Here's the Colossi of Memnon, as we call it today. That is a Greek term, and it comes from a story, a legend of some whistling stones. This mortuary temple is pretty symbolic. It sits out where the floodwaters would come up, and then when they receded, this represented the primordial mound of a moon where creation takes place. I thought I would show this. I drew this red line right between the two huge Colossi and Memnon statues. Let's watch where the sun rises at Amenhotep's mortuary temple here. But on this date here, December 21st, the day the sun dies, that's the alignment of his mortuary temple. These people related the stories of the sun and the sky to their lives on earth and the Pharaoh's rule. It's pretty amazing. All this stuff is still being unearthed in Egypt even today. It says Aram Online reports that the six foot long head and torso of the colossal statue of the falcon headed god Horus has been unearthed from the Hapostal style hall at the funerary temple of Amenhotep III, who ruled Egypt from 1390 to 1352 BC. He was one of the most powerful rulers in all Egyptian history. It says Horus is shown wearing a pleated kilt around his waist with a horizontally pleated belt. 
the statue was missing its arms and no inscriptions were found on it. So that kind of makes you wonder, but that is a really cool statue there. And you notice his eyes here are the eyes of Horus here, literally. Here's a look at the whole statue or what's left of it that they found here. Pretty interesting. Let's move on. Next story. Let's go down to Florida. There's a pretty cool find on here. Some of these stories are very recent and some of these are kind of recent. But this is the Raleigh Islands and on Raleigh Island here itself. Pretty good discovery was made. Let's just read. This is a Tampa Bay Times. Archaeologists with drone find bead making settlements. Scientists stumbled upon the site while assessing BP oil spill effects in 2010. Here is an area where they are excavating. Archaeologist Terry Barber excavates a bead making site on Raleigh Island in the lower Suwannee National Wildlife Refuge. Barber's team then use a drone with radar to map the entire village of 37 ring-shaped piles. But here is the discovery they made with LIDAR. Here is another LIDAR pick, the settlement. And this discovery would have been impossible without this new technology. It says the images the drone produced gave the archaeologists a clear picture of both the size of the settlement and its arrangement, although they still have questions. For instance, Sassaman said they don't know why the rings were arranged in a cloverleaf pattern or whether the larger square areas were used for some other purpose. Meanwhile, they have continued to dig up iridescent beads and the bead making materials. Each bead was just a little smaller than a dime and made with a drill hole in the middle. In the ancient culture, the beads weren't used as money. They symbolize spiritual values. So pretty interesting story there. Now, I have made numerous ancient America videos where I report there are beads or conch shells from Florida. Well, this appears to be a site where they were produced and then traded trade systems were vast in ancient America. That is a report from Florida and five other news stories. I hope you thought that was interesting and you all have a very nice day.